Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we are going to be finishing up our series, An Intergalactic Obliteration of the Cosmic Fine-Tuning, Argument for the Existence of God. In this video, we're going to be looking at why cosmology is not science, with Karl Popper. So, despite my best efforts to demonstrate the flaws in science, some people still put a great deal of credence in it. However, only a select few put faith in so-called pseudo-sciences. The objection that I will present here is not to undermine science as a whole, but rather to demonstrate that the conclusions of cosmology are not scientific conclusions in the same way we can consider other science conclusions scientific, but rather pseudo-scientific conclusions, and therefore our very basis of the cosmic fine-tuning argument is no more stable than some other pseudoscience, like astrology. In order to help me with this process, we're going to be calling on the philosopher Karl Popper. So Karl Popper is one of the most influential philosophers of science of the 20th century. Some of his most famous work is on the problem of demarcation between science and pseudoscience. So Popper acknowledged that Hume was correct with the problem of induction to state that no universal statement made by science can be verified, shown to be true. However, according to Popper, the difference between scientific theories and pseudoscientific theories is that scientific theories are those that can be falsified or shown to be false. So, when we say that something can be falsified, we mean that some observation can show it to be false. We could receive some data that would convince us to abandon or get rid of that theory. If, for example, all of our emeralds turned blue and not green, then the hypothesis that all emeralds are green would be falsified. But the hypothesis that they are all grew, see the new riddle of induction for more information if you're confused, would not be verified, as they might all turn red at some later time, causing us to think that they are ruid instead, but still not verifying that conclusion. So, cosmology works into this as follows. So all of cosmology is based on a principle known as the cosmological principle, which states simply that what we can observe of the universe is a representative sample, and the laws of the universe hold everywhere in the universe. In other words, when observed from a large enough scale, the properties of the universe are the same no matter from where they are observed. Basically, if this principle were not the case, then we would not be able to do cosmology, because we don't have direct access to enough of the universe to understand any possible differences between areas of the universe. Basically, the way we understand cosmology is we see something happen very far away, we understand the basic properties that things like light have here on Earth, and we guess at what those properties would mean for something very large and very far away, very distantly, assuming that those things follow the same rules that stuff does here on Earth. But if it didn't follow the same rules, then our assumptions about things that are very far away would be completely incorrect. If this is a little confusing, think of it like a culture that lives on a small island on a planet. They can see other lands on the planet, but they have no way of getting across the ocean to actually experience those worlds, though they have great observational technologies and ways of seeing things and measuring things on those other lands. Because they want to develop theories about those other lands, even though they can't visit them, they're forced to assume that their island is similar to those lands, and that the rules that things follow on their island are the rules that things follow on other lands. So imagine that they see an object that they don't recognize fall out of a tree at a certain speed and make a certain size dent in the sand. Like I said, they have pretty advanced observational techniques and technologies. So if they want to figure out the properties of that object, then they must assume that mass, gravity, air resistance, and sand all behave like they do on their island. If the rules apply differently in some way, then they would not be able to know anything about that object because they wouldn't be able to test similar objects and find a similar object that behaves in the same way, because if the rules applied differently, that would mean the objects weren't necessarily similar. 
But the problem is that if gravity or air resistance, for example, work differently on other lands, their calculations would be, in fact, incorrect. And what they thought they had discovered about that object's mass, for example, would be wrong. These assumptions are also troubling because there's no way that we could prove that these assumptions are false. If some object on another land fails to follow the laws that we have here on our island, we can just assume that it's made of some different kind of material that interacts with the laws in a different way. We don't need to throw out the laws, we can just make more assumptions about the way things work on those other lands. Because if we throw out the law, we've stopped doing this whole science and studying of other lands. This should clearly be recognizable as the problem of holistic underdetermination. If you don't know what that is, check out my series on the subject. There is no way to tell if we should throw out the assumption that everything acts the same everywhere, or the conclusion that the object is made of similar matter. The problem is that the islanders are strongly biased against getting rid of that assumption, because that would mean that they couldn't study those other lands at all. Now, statistically, it should be very clear that a very small area, which is not randomly selected, is not representative of the entire world. It's like to poll who's going to win an election, grabbing just a group of people coming out of a single polling station in a single county. This would not be a representative sample size because you haven't gotten a random sample of everyone. You've just collected a group of people that are all very close together. Similarly, collecting an area that's very close together can't be statistically representative of the entire universe as a whole. It's completely unjustified to think that you can learn about the rest of the world without ever leaving your small little island. Similarly, nothing can falsify the cosmological principle. Even though many recent observations have been made which seem to contradict the cosmological principle, it can't be discarded, because without it, that means we just have to discard all of cosmology. And no cosmologist wants to claim that we simply can't do cosmology anymore. And so if something is not falsifiable, then it's not scientific. As Karl Popper himself is said to have disagreed with the principle, on the grounds that it makes the fact that we don't know something reason for us to claim that we do know something, which is completely ridiculous. He was supposed to have said that this was a scientific dogma that in fact we never should have invented in the first place. Basically, this is kind of a theorem that we can put out there and it lets us do some cool math and make up theories about the universe as it is, but if it happens to be false and there's no reason for us to assume it should be true, then all of those theories are completely and totally unjustified. The only reason we keep it around is because it's the only way for us to do such cool cosmological configurations, calculations, models, and theories. So, objection 36 to the cosmic fine-tuning argument. There is reason to doubt all of the so-called cosmic constants, as they are only arrived at if we assume that our little corner of the universe is representative of the whole universe. Now, this is equivalent to never leaving your house and thinking that you can learn everything about the world by just peeking out your window and doing experiments within the few objects you have in your house. Cosmology is nothing but an unverifiable pseudoscience, and we should take the conclusions that it draws to be no more justified than those of any other pseudoscience, like astrology. Thus, there is no reason to put any faith in the cosmic fine-tuning argument, as the very principles that the argument bases itself on are no more foundational, important, or scientific than astrology. And with that, we have 36, 6 times 6, a devil's dozen of objections for the cosmic fine-tuning argument. This concludes not only our series on the cosmic fine-tuning argument, but our series on the teleological arguments for the existence of God as well. If you missed any of those, we had arguments from analogy, the watch argument, as well as abductive arguments, and most recently, our series, an intergalactic obliteration of the cosmic fine-tuning argument. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.